So welcome to the Lake Bluff School District 65 Board of Education budget hearing for September 24th, 2019. Julie, can you please take the roll? Mark Berry. Present. Leanne Charlo, absent. Julie Gottschall, present. John Morosen. Present. Richard Hegg. Present. Andy Duran. Present. Ann Hill. Present. Okay, we've got a quorum. We can begin the statement of purpose for the budget hearing. The purpose of the meeting is to allow the public to comment on the proposed 2019-2020 school budget. People desiring to speak should be recognized by the president, state their name and address, then make their comment. Written comments may be handed to the president. So we will begin with our director of business operations, Mr. Jay Khan, and uh, take us through the budget. Kevin, can you do me a favor before he starts and go close that door? So if everybody comes in, kind of keeping the noise out. For... Thank you. Okay, um, I, I'll take the, uh, the community through the 2019-2020 budget. Um, this is actually the final budget. It, it, it includes the boiler replacement and the casework at the middle school. Um, we'll go through historical results over revenue and expenditure assumptions, um, look at our debt service, and talk a little about fund balance. And this, uh, this budget has been seen several times um, in its tentative form, uh, and then this is the f before the, really before the summer, and then after the summer we came back and uh, showed you one that was more final, and this is the, the last look at the budget before it's approved. So the, uh, as I said last week, the, 20, the 1920 budget is a surplus operating budget of $63,000 uh, with a net deficit as we are funding our boiler replacement out of capital expenditures uh, for a total uh, reduction in fund balance at the end of the year uh, of approximately $285,000. Um, and as I said, the confidence in this budget, it's a 50-50 budget, so there's a, I very, feel very comfortable about hitting it. Just a quick look back at our historical um, fund balance. We were up in the past at over, at about one times, or 100% one, one, uh, of operating expenditures. Uh, and since that time, we've refunded, uh, restructured our debt, refunded some debt, uh, issued some more bonds, and spent money restructuring the middle school. Um, if you look out sort of we've at the tail end, which is the most recent period, we flattened out. And um, last year we had a small uh, surplus because we postponed, or 1718, we postponed the air conditioners at the elementary school. It was budgeted in at 1718 and it didn't get spent. So we had a surplus and then we had the net deficit last year as we replaced the air conditioners. And then this year, we're more or less balanced um, funding the small capital project of the boilers out of fund balance. Looking at revenue, uh, our property taxes, operating funds are going up 2.5% uh, for our property taxes. 2.1% is the CPI, so existing property is going up at CPI. And the balance is coming from new property. Debt service is increasing according to the schedule approved uh, when it was issued by 1.3%. And then we've increased our fees for pre-K pre and transportation this year, so we expect a little bit more revenue from that. And then the food service um, revenue is going to increase because we're receiving both the revenue and expense for food service, whereas we were formerly, um, parents were paying kiddos, now they're paying the district for lunch. So we'll see an increase uh, in revenue, but that'll be offset by expenses. State revenue, um, we're getting our evidence-based funding uh, minimum minimum amount, the same as last year. And that comes in very predictably in 22 equal installments. And then uh, transportation categorical funding is less predictable, so that's been funded conservatively. Uh, looking at the revenue, as I said, the total operating revenue is going up 3%, total revenue is going up 3%. Um, and then by fund, it's changing a little bit based on um, just as we move money around to, in order to keep our individual fund balances where they should be. Uh, looking at the amount of revenue we get, uh, our revenue comes primarily from property taxes at 90%. Other local includes 
fees and lunch revenue. Um, the state is mostly the base funding minimum, and then the federal revenue is grant revenue, um, title and idea grant revenue. Expenditures, salaries are increasing 6%. As I said, this is the first year of our new teacher contract where we increase salaries um, by a significant amount to enhance the starting pay in order to attract teachers. Um, after, in the out years of the five-year contract, it's a CPI increase. The classified staff and admin increases are 3%, and there have been no net staffing changes. Benefits are increasing at 2.5%, uh, largely because they are um, mostly, most of them are proportional to salaries, so they're going up with the salaries, but that's offset by our favorable renewal in our health care. We had a almost a 1% decrease in our PPO premium, and with the new contract, we've also um, introduced some lower cost plans, and staff is are paying a higher portion of the premium. Uh, special education, we're seeing an increase this year. We're having uh, seven outplacements versus two in the past, so there's a, a big uh, gap versus prior year, and we're funding uh, 0.2 FTE contract psychologists out of NSSED through a federal grant. We're, with our capital spending plan, uh, the boiler at the middle school is being funded from fund balance, and then we did um, significant work on casework and bathrooms at the middle school to kind of complete that renovation so that the building is totally finished and looks new. And then we uh, installed over the summer a gym, new audiovisual equipment in the LBES gym. Transportation, um, I didn't, uh, this slide actually didn't get updated. We, I had budgeted the same number of routes, but we re were able to reduce a route. So in the final budget, we actually have one less route than last year. Um, and then we have also uh, increased our fees. So uh, basically, the, some of the changes we made, uh, instead of reserving a spot for every student, we're only reserving spots for people who sign up on the bus. So we were able to cut the number of routes and put more kids on a bus and save money that way. And then we um, are also brought in some, some revenue. Special ed transportation is going up, though, because with the outplacements, we have to provide special uh, transportation for each child, um, they, and they pretty much go in their own vehicle. Uh, technology, we have new Chromebooks for our second graders, um, new, and our eighth grade MacBooks are coming off lease. And then we are extending the teacher computer lease for one additional year, and then food service expenses are going up um, in, in step with revenue as we are paying the full cost of our Quest food service instead of, um, instead of parents paying kiddos. Looking at operating expenditures, um, I basically just went through these. Salaries are going up 6%, benefits 2.4%. Purchase services are going up 4.4%. Um, and that's, like, that's largely due to the fact that we are um, having an increase in special ed transportation, which is a purchase service, and then also one of our, um, we were outsourcing our tech support services where they used to be in-house, so that's the change there. Capital um, change we've already talked about, and then the dues and fees are showing a net decrease, and this is basically a big increase in special ed spending offset by the fact that we had a big, um, we spent a, a big settle, legal settlement last year that we're not spending. So. We have a reduction due to last year's legal settlement, but then we're down about half as much because we've increased our special ed spending. Expenditures net are going up 3.7%, uh, and um, our debt service and capital projects show that the, so the total um, are going down 1.4%. This, looks, this is a breakout of how our money is spent. Um, if you include debt service, two-thirds of our spending is in salaries and benefits, 13% in purchase services, debt service accounts for 11% of our spending, and then 5% um, only on supplies and 5% on everything else. Uh, our, this is our debt service schedule. It's, it's uh, fairly stable, increasing uh, slightly each year through 2029, and then uh, we'll be paying off the funds that the bonds that funded the elementary school, and we'll have just left just our debt service um, base extension funds that are funding the middle school renovation. 
Um, so looking at our fund balance, we're projecting to end the year at 34% of operating expenditures at about $6 million um, with that reduction of just under $300,000 um, in total. That's within our fund balance range, policy range of 30 to 50%. And then looking out um, over five years, you can see that our fund balance projection, we're looking at 4.6 million or below the 30% threshold in 24, 25. Um, as we talked about last time, this has a natural downward trend because I'm forecasting revenues increasing at uh, two, two to three percent, basically CPI, um, and the salaries in our contract, are run, the inflation built into salaries and benefits naturally runs higher than that. So there's a, a um, natural downward shift to that. Um, but as we balance every budget and work, we have things like new property, um, and we work really hard each year to balance the budget and look for savings. So this is. Um, we don't, we don't expect to, we expect to stay within our fund balance range out through 22, 23, and make adjustments to keep that going into the future. And that is the 1920 budget. Anybody on the board have any comments or questions for Mr. Kahn? Nicely done. Thank you. Anybody uh, from the public have any questions that they'd like to address about the, uh, the budget? Okay, not hearing any. I'm kind of glad it's over. <laughs> glad it's over? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I not, never uh, thought I would ever hear you say that. <laughs> so not hearing any, I'm gonna uh, ask for a motion to adjourn the budget hearing at 7 p.m. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the budget hearing is over. We're gonna move right into our regular meeting. Ready? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the Lake Bluff School District 65 Board of Education regular meeting for September 24th, 2019. Julie, could you please take the roll? Mark Berry. Present. Leanne Charlo, absent. Julie Gottschall, present. John Morosen. Present. Richard Hegg. Present. Andy Duran. Present. Ann Hill. Present. So we have a quorum. We can begin. And if everybody will stand and please join me for this Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So at this time, we offer the opportunity for anybody in the audience, if they'd like to address the board, to please do so. We ask that when, if you do, you state your name and address, you limit your comments to five minutes, and we will not be engaging in questions and answers at the meeting, but if anybody has questions they, they raise, we will take note and publish answers later. Nobody's gonna step forward. We will move on to introducing some new teaching staff. Did you wanna ask for addition of discussion items? Oh, I do, yes, sorry. Um, is there anything that the board would like to see as a future agenda item that we need to cover? or something that just needs to be discussed but not voted on tonight? No, okay, so now we'll move to an introduction of some new teaching staff. If Margaret and Nate could come on up, they are going to introduce our new teacher coordinators um, and when they come up, I have a little, a special little thing for both of them. I've been really, really proud of the, our two new teacher leaders. Um, they've been doing this, I think, every year, except for one since I've been here. Um, they've impacted a lot of our teachers' lives, and our teachers stay because they give them such a great beginning. So we have the educational leadership this year for the National Journal is what new teachers need. So I got your copy of that, and then just a little something from me tonight after you're introduced. So our Lake Bluff Elementary School um, new teacher coordinator, mentor coordinator is Amanda Willey. So we'll have Amanda come on up. She will introduce our new staff. Um, one of the most frequent questions that we get from candidates that we interview 
are do you have a mentor program because new candidates really are interested in knowing how they're going to be supported in our building so we are always really pleased and happy to explain our mentoring program to them and it's actually a two-year program for our new staff so it's really comprehensive and Amanda and Adrian are a big part of that hello thanks for having me um, we have three brand new teachers, well not brand new teachers, but brand new to our school. Um, Julie Volge is our new uh, pre-K teacher. We have Vicki Weber who is music and STEAM, she's got quite the role. And then Tim Burks is our new school psychologist. Thanks, thanks for coming. And at the middle school, Adrienne Olmsted uh, works with our mentors and our teachers new to the building. She does a fantastic job. And uh, to echo something that Margaret already said, uh, it is always part of any interview process where uh, teachers will ask, do you have a mentor program? And what does that look like? And I'm always very pleased to say, why, yes, we do. Let me tell you about it. But uh, thank you, Adrienne, for all the work that you've done. And I'll let Adrienne introduce our new staff. Hello, good evening, thank you for having me. We have two lovely new additions to our staff this year. We have Sarah Coleman, who, and both of our new teachers are both live in Arlington Heights, which is kind of a coincidence. But Sarah Coleman is our new learning behavior specialist, and Hillary Masterton is our new sixth grade social studies teacher. And we're very lucky to have both of them. So thank you guys for being here. Oh, I'm so sorry, Julia Marin. I'm so sorry. That was a, so sorry, because that was, uh, so Julia Marin also returning to us is our seventh and eighth grade um, language arts teacher. Very lucky to have all three. Sorry about that, Julia. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Well, welcome to Lake Bluff Schools, and thank you very much. You guys are welcome to stay, but not required. I know you got a lot to do. Thanks for coming tonight. We appreciate it. Jerry's here, and so is Aaron. Both. Oh, okay. And you may want to ask them if they want to come up and talk or just recognize them. So we're going to move on to our reports. And I understand we have our new PTO uh, president here. Is there, would she like to address the board? This is Carrie Steinbach. Hi, I'm Carrie Steinbach. I'm the new district PTO president. And I just thought I'd come and give a little update on what we're working on this year. Um, today we had a little party for Alice Wagner, our school secretary, who's leaving us at the end of the week. And um, gave everyone a chance to say thank you, gave notes, and I think she had a nice time. Um, we have some upcoming fundraisers, fundraisers and current fundraisers. We're doing box tops. We are doing a wrapping paper fundraiser and that goes until this week. We do spirit wear as well. Uh, book fair is coming up in October, the 24th and 25th, and we invite grandparents to come for the first couple hours to peruse and buy for um, grandkids in the area, or we also call it a special person, can come and shop for them. Um, the Pumpkin Fest is coming up October 18th, and then the Pumpkin Chase is going to be uh, the 26th. We also will start our bluffer nights, which are nights that are at like Chipotle or Luke's or Jimmy John's where they give a portion of the sales a uh, specific night that we agree on back to the school. And those are gonna start in November and carry us through until probably April or May, depending on how long our year goes. Um, and then in the spring, we'll have a spring auction um, combined with the spring scramble, the golfing outing that we did. But I have no hardcore info on that yet so um, I think that what we voted on in our last meeting is that we will be donating a portion of our fundraising for the playground at the elementary school this year um, and then along with all the other things that were asked for um, on the volunteering side of it we are doing a couple of social studies programs for first and second grade which will allow parents to come and help out we also do the recycle and compost um, part in the elementary school and the middle school where we allow the parents to come in and help sit with their kids at lunch and then dispose of the waste. 
And that's as much Sounds as like I can. It's, it's Curie, super fun. <laughs> Carrie, before you leave though, just yes. so everybody knows, because I'm gonna have Aaron also do this. Tell me, tell us about your family. I probably should have started off with that. Um, my name, I have it on here, name. So, <laughs> um, my name is Carrie Steinbach. I am a mom of five boys that are currently all in the Bless school you. system here. Um, I have twins that are in preschool. Yeah. Twins are in the four-year-old preschool um, at the elementary school. And then I have a first grader, second grader, and fourth grader. So I'm almost to the middle school. So really, you if you calculate this, you could be the PTO president at least three or four more times <laughs> after I think this. We have, there's something in our policy, I'm pretty sure, that <laughs> they can be changed. If not, there will be, yeah, right? right? Yeah. I'll bring it up at the next meeting. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. And now we'd like to introduce our new Aaron. Alliance director, Mr. Aaron Mulf Mulford. Mulford. Welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Mulford. I'm uh, we've, my wife and I, Melanie, are uh, are relatively new residents to Lake Bluff about the last two and a half years, I think, and I've been involved with Alliance about two years and three months of that. So I noticed that registration, there was the little line about would you like to donate, and we started looking into what this was, and I just thought it was a fantastic organization. I'd never uh, kind of seen anything like that at any of the schools that we had been a part of. So um, really, really excited to be here. My son Anderson is in second grade. We just have one, have the one. So um, he. Um, yeah, second grade with Mrs. King. So, yeah, that's about it for me. So he swims. A lot of people swims. here yep. swim. Yeah. Yep. So he just started. He was in the sharks uh, for the summer, and then we quickly got him over into scouts. So he's been in the scouts about uh, about three weeks now. So good. Um, so I got basically I'd been acting as the project manager for Alliance over the, about the last year and a half. And about mid-August, I got a note from Mark saying, hey, how'd you like to be president? So, um, you know, we had, uh, we met over at the brewery. We thought that was probably <laughs> the best place to... Uh, convince you. Convince me, yeah. So, anyway, no, but I'm, I'm really excited about it. Uh, we haven't really had much in the way. We've had our first meeting. Uh, we've looked at the, we've spoken to everybody, kind of started to get everybody aligned with the positions and roles um, that they want to be involved in based on skill sets. So. It's going to be a relatively slow transition, I think. So Mark's staying on as past president slash vice president. And uh, so he's going to kind of help walk me through the, the process over the first year. He's also going to take an active role in recruiting to make sure that we have um, the right people, um, particularly folks. So right now we have a lot of folks who have children who are you know, starting to approach middle school. So we're going to try and start recruiting some people who have uh, the kids in the kindergarten, uh, first grade. So we can hopefully have them stick mm -mm. around for a while. Mm -mm. Um, yeah. Our fall mm -hmm. letter writing campaign is about to kick off, and that's uh, that's in the process now. So October's meeting will will really be kind of focused on on getting the letter uh, written and, and distributing them out to um, amongst the, the the other folks in the alliance. So that's about what I have for now. So. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, thank welcome. you for Appreciate taking that on. It. You bet. Thank you. Okay, back to reports. Um, skipping down, the only, I, I have no others other than for myself, I just want to say uh, a brief update on our superintendent search. We are well underway. Uh, the board just had an update in closed session prior, learning about the wealth of applicants who are applying. Uh, parents and community members have had a chance to uh, uh, put their two cents in and in focus groups the past few days this week. And there's an online survey still available for community members to fill out to give their opinions as to uh, what that new superintendent should look like. And you can find a link to that on our website, right? Mm -hmm. um, we will be hearing at our next meeting uh, what they call a superintendent profile where the search firm takes all the data from the focus groups and the surveys summarizes it for the board and tells the board here's what your community is looking for in a new superintendent and we will use that or the super the uh, search firm will use that to help screen all the applicants that they have and boil it down to a handful of candidates who we will start no, uh, interviewing in november mm -hmm. in november and have it all done by the middle of december i believe so uh Fill out that survey online if you haven't already. Jean, Dr. Sophie has a report. A uh, quick update. I sent you all an email um, 
we have already had to use one of our emergency days uh, due to the flooding, but I did want to update you on a couple of good things. Um, we will have a late start option this year where everything will be moved forward two hours. Uh, that's important on especially those really cold days where the ki it's, it's dangerous maybe at 7 or 7.15 when the kids would be outside, but by 9 or 9.15, it's not dangerous anymore according to the wind chill. So we have that option. It was scheduled to go out on October 1st, and then I looked at the weather report for Sunday of this past weekend where it looked like we were gonna have flooding again, so we sent it out Saturday just to make sure we were covered. Um, when I get a call in the morning from the police chief at about 3.30 or 3.45, and it's happened under five times here, um, it's never a good thing, and I would share with you that when the viaduct here is flooded and the viaduct in Lake Forest is flooded and there's down power lines and 41 is closed, there, there really isn't much of an option. And I know it's very inconvenient for parents. Um, one of the things, they're changing the way they're doing e-learning days this year. And so one of our options would be that if we wind up thinking that we're gonna use more emergency days, we could actually do an e-learning day, for instance, on the February Institute Day, when the kids are already off. We could call it the e-learning day to make up for the Friday we already had to use and give the kids a week to turn in their assignments. So parents like Carrie with five boys in the house wouldn't have to be worried about getting all five of them on track doing their work. Um, the teachers would already be here for teacher institutes so they could monitor their emails. We could make it work. The only way we can do that though, we have two big concerns. Number one, we're still waiting on rules from the state on our special ed kids and how we would provide accommodations. They were supposed to be out, I think beginning August 1st and every week it's like they're gonna come out this week and we're still waiting for them. The second concern which we're gonna take care of is the board has to have a hearing on an e-learning day, even to make it a possibility. So in October, we will have a hearing, just like you had with Jay tonight for his budget, talking about how we would generally do an e-learning day. Um, and then at least the options here. It doesn't mean we have to use it, but it gives us the option if it looks like um, we need some alternatives to emergency days. If you look at one farmer's almanac, they're per, they are actually saying we're gonna have the exact same winter as last year, only worse. I can't imagine it being worse. The other one is saying, fooey on you, we're gonna have a great winter and it's gonna be warm and it's gonna be fine. So I'm choosing the more positive one and we're planning because I find the more I plan and get everything out, it never happens. So I'm just gonna be planning up a storm and hoping the weather will be good. So we're on it. Um, we certainly are entertaining any parent calls. I, we had a couple concerns that we addressed on Facebook. Thanks, Kevin logged in and actually c contacted it ad uh, because it turned out our district office phones were down and he was unable to call, so Kevin just picked up the phone and called him. Um, it is important for our families to understand, though, that sometimes we just don't have an option. So I'll continue to keep you informed on that. That's it. All right, thanks. So we're gonna move on to discussions and begin with a middle school standards-based reporting survey results report by Kelly Bay and Nate Blackmer. Pardon us while we get it pulled up. Good evening, uh, thank you very much for having us. Um, we'll be tag teaming a little bit here and trading off on, uh, on different pieces of this. Uh, but there we go. Um, goals for the presentation. We wanna just do a quick overview, a review of some of the really underpinning the, the critical elements of SBR. 
Um, we'll talk about the parent survey that was administered in June and provide a summary of those results. And based on the information that we got back from parents, talk with you a bit about the next steps for our standards-based reporting committee, given the information that was provided to us by, uh, by the families that completed the survey. Um, so first of all, in terms of, a, of an overview, um, some of the critical elements here uh, includes uh, fostering a growth mindset among our students. Um, learning is an ongoing process, uh, and kids need to understand the importance of building on the skills and the knowledge that they acquire. Um, one of the most uh, valuable ways of doing that is through very specific uh, feedback that we provide to our students. Uh, that occurs in a variety of ways, but the goal is always the same. We want to uh, continue to help students to uh, improve their learning. Uh, and very often the feedback that they're going to get from their teachers is the best way to go about doing that. Um, teachers are also um, continually evaluating not only the students' learning, but also their own instructional practices. Uh, being able to respond quickly uh, really is important. We've got a, a defined period of time in which to teach this content um, and continually taking the pulse of the class, understanding what students are coming in with in terms of prior knowledge and being able to fill in the gaps if there are areas where they need uh, some review is important. Um, ongoing assessment of student progress toward the learning target uh, is the essential piece to this. We're being held accountable to learning standards. All of our students are expected to be able to know and do certain things by the end of each grade um, by having that in the forefront of what teachers are thinking as they're planning and preparing their lessons. We're really getting a jump start on uh, helping our students to be prepared, not only for those state mandated assessments, but be prepared really to uh, demonstrate mastery of the content uh, at each of those, uh, in each of those standards across the board. Um, so, so that's the, uh, the review of standards-based reporting. All right. So we administered a survey to parents last June. Wanted to report out the findings of that survey. Um, so I think it's important to know that the survey was sent to about 210 families from Lake Bluff Middle School. Um, it was comprised of six questions. The results from the survey came from 50 people, 50 parents. Um, and there were 28 comments that were a part of kind of the question number six that was opened up to additional comments. Um, upon review of the survey, so Mr. Blackmer and I looked at the survey and then we met with six or seven members of our standards-based <coughs> reporting committee um, and we were able to pull out three big themes from the results. So we discovered that parents are looking for more information about work completion, so the work that's mostly homework, but the work that's completed outside of school. Um, parents indicated that not enough information comes home, and many parents feel like they understand standards-based reporting. So we're just gonna run you through a couple of graphics that come from the Google Form survey that was sent. So the first one on the bottom um, shows us that about three-fourths of those that took the survey um, understand, believe that they understand standards-based reporting. Um, we wanted to know a little bit more about, oh, sorry. There we go. Accessing standards-based information. So there's a lot of different ways that parents could have learned more or understood standards-based reporting. Um, so the bigger pieces that came out are that families understand more about talking with their child and they understand more through reading the weekly update. Sorry, Shell. <laughs> Do you want to just click it for me? Thank you. We have a problem sometimes because Shelly downloads everything in PowerPoint and Kelly and Nate really wanted theirs in Google to have some other Can access. And Another. we have problems with oh, Google slides in, in here for some reason. I don't know why it is. Um, it skipped over the video. There we go. Um, so our next question was related to the learner characteristics, sort of those um, skills outside of the actual academic standards. So wanted to know, um, if parents felt like that piece was important. Um, and through this one, we learned that about eight parents or 16% did not feel that they were valuable. So the majority thought that yes, that piece is important, which wasn't previously separated in the report card. 
And then we asked about the communication preference. There we go. So we um, discovered through this that email seems to be, through this survey, the preferred communication preference. Um, there are a number of people, single people, who um, mentioned other. So I think it's worth noting that these were these other comments were less related to forms of communication and more related to um, requests. So wanting to know more about homework um, or work completion, um, families use that other spot to communicate those needs. What is Otis? Sure. Um, so Otis is the electronic tool or the online platform that we use to communicate student performance with families. In the past, we used PowerSchool. Oh, okay. um, PowerSchool is an extraordinary tool when it comes to a point-based gradebook um, and did a really good job of communicating through that. They have made shifts to standards-based reporting, but it, in the year of using it, wasn't communicating the things that we needed to families. Um, we still use PowerSchool as a student information system, but Otis is really the online gradebook that's being used at middle school. Thank you. All right, so those were um, the big questions and the results that came from the survey. Nate's gonna talk um, about a couple of next steps based on this information. So uh, as we indicated at the beginning, work completion um, is, is a, an ongoing conversation that we're having at the committee level. Um, certainly as a parent at home looking to support their kids, um, that's probably one of the biggest elements that teach, that parents communicate to us. I want to know when my student is missing an assignment or turning things in late or incomplete or not doing quality work. Um, despite some of the misinformation that had been disseminated, perhaps by kids, homework is still required, it is still recorded, and it is still communicated as part of those learner characteristics, but we want to make sure that we're effectively communicating with parents when students are missing assignments and when we need a little support to help get things turned in. Um, whether or not Otis is going to be the perfect tool for that is kind of yet to be determined. We want to continue to work with the developers and see if that's the, the best way to uh, communicate with parents about the uh, homework. So we're going to be working on that very specifically this year. Um, Kelly will talk a little bit more about some of the curricular pieces, and then I'll come back to talk more about Otis. So there were definitely pieces within that survey that we were not surprised um, on the results, and I would say um, that our parents agree on the next step slide. The same <laughs> thing. Oh, sorry. There it is. Um, so we agree that there, the majority of communication about a student's learning is coming outside of the progress report. The progress report is a nice summary of where students are in terms of mastery of a standard. Um, we really want, and are working with teachers this year, a lot um, of them already communicate at the end of each unit how students performed during that unit. So that's where the feedback is coming in. We're helping students to know and identify what do you know and understand currently about this concept in social studies? Where do we need to get you next? So we want to communicate that more um, clearly and consistently with students so then it can in turn be clearly and consistently communicated to parents. Um, and we're sort of thinking going back to kind of a familiar place of we're gonna send this home and have parents sign it so that we know that they've seen it um, because that will help us to ensure that the, there's a little bit of a paper trail. There are portfolio options where we can electronically share so that parents can see things, um, but we do feel like, as with the middle school time, um, that conversation isn't necessarily the piece that's happening. So if we have that, that piece of paper that's coming home where parents can say, oh, I see how my child has done on this unit, sign, and it can go back to the teacher, um, then we feel like we're doing our part in sending more information home and having parents confirm that they've received it. Sort of along those lines of making sure that parents have access to this information. So yes, the old school method of sending home paper copies of that feedback that uh, teachers are providing and requiring a signature is great. Uh, teachers also did receive uh, training at the beginning of this year 
on a component of Otis that uh, has a lot of promise for some of that as well. Um, there's a portfolio piece. Uh, students are able to contribute to their own portfolio. Teachers are able to contribute to portfolio pieces. And parents are able to then also look at that information. Uh, and it's the sort of thing that could follow them year to year, depending upon how we choose to uh, uh, employ that. Uh, but that's something that I know some teachers are already experimenting with and uh, hopefully will be something that parents can look forward to seeing in the future. Um, in terms of Otis, um, continuing to support parents on using the platform. And it does differ depending upon whether you're accessing from a, a personal computer versus a mobile device. The interface looks a little different. So we're, uh, we're identifying the need of, uh, to share some instructional videos, uh, give uh, families a, a chance to, to know where to look. Um, and we're also talking with our kids. They're using it, and very often they're a great resource for parents. And so um, they know that their parents have They choose to be. If they choose to be. If you, if, you, if you are so inclined as to ask some questions of your, direct questions of the kids about using Otis, they uh, should be able to help you. Um, but the other thing that I would say is um, the uh, developers with Otis are listening to our requests and listening to the feedback that we're providing. Uh, they're continually working to improve it, um, and certainly uh, feedback from schools is the way in which they're doing that. And so I do appreciate that they're uh, a local um, organization, um, downtown Chicago, started up in Evanston, and so some of the original uh, folks who've rolled Otis out are very uh, interested in making sure that Lake Bluff is happy with the way that it works. So um, we appreciate the responsiveness to our request in that regard. So that brings us to the end. If you have any questions, we're, uh, we're here. I mean, it, it's out of 210 families, roughly, well, 36%, that's about 60 families responded that they're e either unclear or that they don't understand it at all. Do you feel like you've put the steps in place to reach those families? Do they have an understanding at least of, of what's Can I just confronting first, them? Um, it was sent to 210 families, but only 50 families took it. Just to clarify the... Um, then a third of those, 15, roughly 16, mm -hmm. don't understand what the program is about. So I'm, I'm more concerned about what steps you've taken, or do you feel comfortable that you've taken the steps that will reach those people to a point where they'll understand? Yeah, what's sure, I'll start. So some of the ways that we have... Um, well, first, I'll acknowledge that the parent education piece matters and is um, major when it comes to this shift because it is new. Um, in terms of understanding what it looks like. So we have had parent nights. Um, one of the parent nights was bringing Otis out to help roll out parent access to that platform. So Two people attended that? That meeting specifically, <coughs> less than 25, but I, I, off the top of my head, I don't remember the exact number. We have mm -hmm. um, had other parent nights with updates and information about sort of what is standards-based reporting, why are we making the shifts, how is it different, um, Nate and I have, there's multiple podcasts on our website. Um, we feel like there's a large or a robust document with frequently asked questions related to standards-based standards -based reporting on the website. Um, and then we also have a handbook that is helpful for parents and families related to the, the topic. So I think a robust website, um, getting people there is another sort of actionable step. Did I leave anything out? I would, I would only add that uh, that was really the reason we asked the question on the survey was to get an understanding of what format are parents really looking for that education to come. We included the email. We included the podcast. I was disappointed by how few people check the podcast, I'll be honest with you, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but really trying to make as many um, uh, opportunities or provide as many opportunities for parents in a format that they see to be most beneficial. Um, I think probably the most in-depth information about standards-based reporting can be found in that handbook that we published on the website. Um, we're actually hearing from quite a few other schools and administrators and even some parents who said, hey, can we, can we talk to you about that information? Because we found it to be very helpful. So. But, but that's why we asked done. the question. Yeah. We're not done. I mean, that's, that's really our work continues. We have a lot more work to do in that area. I have a quick clarification because when I've done um, goals with teachers this year, one of the things they've talked about is they're still trying to figure out the communication piece when they finish up a unit. And so if I'm, for instance, an eighth grade parent with a boy that never tells me anything, how am I gonna know that that 
Am I going to get it emailed? Because that's safe. I'll, I'll get that. If it's a piece of paper, I'll never get it. How am I going to know as a parent that there's feedback for me? In terms of in, a, in the platform, in the Otis platform? Is it going to be in Otis? Is it going to be an email? How is that going to be? Because you had mentioned portfolios, but there's not a sign-off on that. Right. One of the, the pieces that the committee has really uh, recognized is that with standards being end-of-year standards, and the idea being that this is where we hope students will get before the end of, or at the, by the end of the school year. Uh, we wanna work to establish some benchmarks so that a parent can know, okay, this unit is over, this particular uh, standard or this particular set of standards we're done with. We're not going to continue to teach those unless there's kids that really need support and really haven't shown mastery of that. Um, and that's why sending home kind of that progress update, even if it doesn't happen to align with the end of the trimester, to say to parents, here it is, we're done with this, please take a look and see how your student is doing. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have questions. But that's, that's I think, the critical piece. That, though. Am I, I gonna... think it would be in... It, would, it seems from our uh, survey that email seem, is, is the preferred method. Okay. So that's how we're going to be reaching out. Or um, likely in the weekly update. Weekly be update, on the lookout. which is also emailed home. Okay. Yeah, I, I do know that uh, a lot of the, e the weekly updates, and, and I appreciate Dr. Rubenstein helping us to clean up that format this year. We've gotten some positive feedback on it. Uh, it's a little easier to navigate, um, and there is a lot of information that goes home. I always ask parents to think about reading that one, perhaps when you have some time to really sit down and digest, maybe coffee on Sunday morning or, or some time when, because there's a lot of information there and it's hard to just get it all in a three minute scroll. And my guess is, and this may be something we want to report out on for reports later, is I'd be curious how many uh, parents at the middle school read the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade updates. I'd be, I mean, well, that we might have, be We actually have some analytics on that with our new tool. We're able to see not only how many people are accessing it, but where geographically. I'm pleased to say we had a few people abroad in the last few weeks that's awesome. in Europe uh, and uh, across the states looking at it. So but that's, are we getting over 50% of our parents generally looking at yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. That's well, good. Well over, well over, yeah. Great. That's close to 90. That's yeah. great news. Yeah, close to 90%. That's not something we had before, so that's been nice no, to be able to see. No, that's great news. Yeah. So, so I have a question. Where in the standards-based grading is the traditional model of a report card and a grade? Is that no longer something that's done, that supplants that, or is it in addition to right. that? Right. That replaces a traditional percentage and letter grade, correct. Okay. So in the survey, I, I, I saw the question about do people understand it. Was there a question, do people like it? Do they think it's effective for parents' needs to monitor? Is it a preferred method? Well, certainly uh, many of the questions had an open-ended opportunity, and then the very end, as we indicated, there were 20, how many were, 20 were three, uh, 28, excuse me, uh, comments. And there were some there uh, that said, boy, you know, we really missed the letter grade. We'd like for there to be a letter grade component. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are a variety of challenges that that presents in terms of communicating accurately about what students know and can do. Um, because a traditional letter grade system does include some approaches that don't align to standards-based reporting. Um, so, so that our goal is to be clear about what kids know and can do. Oftentimes that letter grade doesn't communicate that. Okay. Uh, I'm a traditionalist, I suppose, in this, in this regard, but I'm, I'm just curious as to generally what the feedback is if parents are appreciating this or if they want the standard space to be supplemental to the, the traditional grade. Yeah, I would say that there were comments that spoke to the idea we'd like for there still to be letter grades. There were comments that were very supportive of the idea that letter grades didn't uh, factor in the way that they once did. Um, so it was, a, it was a mixed bag in terms of the comments, the open-ended comment uh, section. Um, I think after one year of implementation, um, making the shift to the proficiency levels over grades, um, I don't know if that's enough time to determine from a parent's perspective if, if it's effective. And I'm not saying that they don't have reactions or emotions related to the shifts that were made, um, but I think that this would be a survey that we would need to perhaps tweak a little, but possibly repeat after a longer implementation period. One of the challenges that I know teachers 
at least in my 10 years, 12, 12 years in this position and seven years prior teaching, there was always a frustration that the letter grade didn't accurately communicate. In some cases, it was a lower grade than we felt really represented what the students uh, had learned or were able to do. And in some cases, it was an overinflation. It was a, a, a very compliant student who did a great job of turning in his homework on time and did a great job of cramming for the test, but when it came time to really apply or synthesize or um, put the, the learning to use, they struggled or really didn't learn it in a way that they were able to come back and, and talk about that learning a week or two or three from the, the test. And so our, our goal is really to talk more specifically not about the accumulation of points and how that divides out and equates to a letter grade, but to really talk about the standards that were held accountable to teaching the kids. So, so that's, that's really where the shift has come in. And the kids being able to articulate that and what they, where they are now and where they need to be. That to me is the exciting piece. Those conversations that kids and teachers are engaging in has been really interesting to observe. You know, it's not the, the typical question we would get, you know, what do I have to do to get the A? That, that was it. That was the, the lead in that was often uh, the question. And now it's more specific. It's, boy, you noticed, I noticed I'm struggling. Well, I don't know, I'll give math as an example with multivariable equations. I'm really having a hard time with that because when you provide me with the assessments, your feedback tells me that. And so now we've got a student who's actually talking with a teacher about a, a, a specific skill, a content area. Um, and they're not just looking to accrue some points that can compensate for this thing they didn't learn and hopefully will learn sometime down the road. Yeah, I guess I don't see them as mutually exclusive principles. And I would think a grade could be a distillation of all of the different things that you've spoken about that sort of, there's just something very satisfying about getting that one, there it is. You know, it takes into account my homework, my understanding, all of these things, and the parents can easily grasp then where their student stands. But I will say I in this way, anyway. That uh, I like the idea of what you're saying of bringing home at the end of each standard or each unit. I, the biggest piece of feedback I've heard is that parents don't understand where their kids are. We know that they're working towards number four or mastery at the end, but we don't know if they're actually going to get there or if they're on their way. So getting you know, along after each unit some information will be really helpful. I'll be anxious to see that, and I think a lot of people would like to see that. I, I have two. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I have two quick things. One, uh, one's really simple. Can we get this digitally? Because this wasn't in our packet. I don't think, right? Yes. Did I miss it? If we could get that, that'd be great. Um, and two, kind of related. Uh, one of my board colleagues up here asked me what I thought of senior based grade, and I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know anything about it. So, um, I know there was there were some community meetings uh, a year or two ago. I think my wife participated in. But um, this is a question I've been asked a couple times, and as I have a fourth grader will be in the middle school in a couple of years, and I have friends that are in that age group. A couple have asked me, and I don't, I want to be able to at least articulate enough to um, have some knowledge. So uh, some some opportunity for new board members, uh, excuse me, or even just sit down with Eugenia, just to explain what it, what we moved from, what we're moving to, and kind of the rationale behind that, because I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure you have all those great answers. I just want to be able to understand it better so I can articulate it to new members. Better. So if there's a process for that, that'd be great. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Great, thanks, thanks. guys. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to our discussion uh, with Dr. Rubenstein and student growth and achievement. As Kevin's gonna tell you as he gets prepared, this is presentation number one. We always have three presentations. Uh, the first one is on our growth using MAP scores. Our second one is on right. Absolutely, there's public comment at the end of the meeting. Does anybody oppose if Joy no, makes a comment? No. No. Go ahead. Let's do, if you just, no, uh, just name an address, five minutes, and we'll take note of any questions or comments you have. I know the girl, I know the girl. Okay. Um, my name's Joy Marquis. I'm at 117 West Blodgett Avenue in Lake Bluff. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for everyone on the board for being here and for letting me speak right now. Um, I just wanted, to, I had a couple questions. One was, were, were eighth grade parents queried in the survey? No, they were, they were not when they submitted the parents with the survey. Okay. They just went to the seventh grade. Okay. Um, I think most of you know, I've, I've been talking about this a lot because I feel like um, the biggest concern is that it's not aligned with the high school. So that's really all I wanted to share again, is that it, 
this standard-based grading is not aligned with the high school. So when our kids go into high school, this is not the grading system that they work with. So it's already a pretty big transition moving into the high school. They're a quarter of the high school when they move into Lake Forest High School. They have a lot of changes. There's a lot of growth going on just in general. And it's just one more thing that they're getting caught up on. Um, I will say that uh, my son just took a test in math. He got it back. Um, he got a three on it. So he got, out of 20 questions, he got two wrong. That was considered a three. I asked how it would be considered a four. It would be if he got 100 all questions right. So that to me is sort of an interesting perception because he looked at me and said, oh, I didn't get a four, this isn't a good test. In fact, the box at the top said he was starting to understand it, it was a math test. And yet, when I looked at it, I said, this is amazing. You got two questions wrong out of 20. This is great. So I think there's a little disconnect in how that is transferred to the student, how they, under, how they understand those numbers. And I'd like to see a little more striation in the three number. Like I feel like it's just too simplified for the kids. There's not enough in there for them to really understand where they're doing in that three. Um, Otis is kind of difficult. It's not always updated. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not on it a lot. I'm sorry I'm not on it a lot because when I do go on it, I don't find any pertinent information that helps me. Um, and I, w I too was hoping that the survey would just generally ask parents what they felt about switching from one grading system to another. We've never actually been asked that. Um, I think you guys know I was on the same parent advisory board as Andy's wife. Um, there was never a discussion of should we do this or not. It was done and then they asked parents, um, okay, what do you think? How should we tweak it? Uh, so I think from the standpoint of being a parent in the community, um, that was a little disappointing. So anyway, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to Dr. Rubenstein and board goal one, student growth and achievement. So as, I'm gonna, as I was gonna finish, Kevin and next month will then be presenting our IAR scores, which is our old park, now called IAR. And then in November, we actually have our comp comparables, and so he'll be presenting how we did in relation to our comparables. Right. So I just went through that for you. There you go. So we're already one slide in. Um, so that was Jean's uh, polite way of saying that uh, this evening's presentation doesn't have outside data in here. So this is all of our inside data, um, and that's the way that we designed it. So because we don't have it yet. Um, that's why. No. It, it, well, we don't have it, but we also don't compare our right. internal MAP scores to other districts. So um, just uh, to remind everybody about um, why we do this and our strategic plan indicators. So um, we've got a couple of indicators that we're gonna take a look at this evening. So the percentage of all students in the expected growth range and I was talking about this with a couple of um, people today. So um, there's a difference between growth and achievement. So um, growth is um, really how much a student is actually growing from year to year. So um, did they grow from a score of 200 to 205 from year to year? And um, MAP and ECRA, our data warehousing um, team, actually sets expectations for that from year to year. Um, and then achievement um, is different, and it's really did they meet a certain bar from year to year. Um, and so here we're actually looking at the percentage of students who are at or above the 40th percentile, which is uh, sort of a magic number. Um, and so that is uh, one of the things we're going to take a look at tonight. The percentage of students achieving um, the 90th percentile or above, um, that's an internal measure that we use. Um, and then we look at all of our um, groups here. So the percentage of students in the EL subgroup achieving above the 50th percentile, um, the percentage of students in the special education subgroup in that same measure, um, and then the percentage of students in our low income subgroup um, achieving at the 50th percentile. So really some interesting measures. So uh, some vocabulary for you uh, to really uh, grasp and understand. So um, NWEA is the company that administers the MAP assessment, um, the measures of academic progress. Those scores went home yesterday for the fall assessments. Um, these scores that we're going to view this evening are a conglomeration of the scores from the last school year. Um, and um, MAP scores are measured in an equal interval scale called a RIT, so the RASH interval unit, um, and it measures student growth. And so really what that means is that 
<clears throat> a movement from a score of 215 to a score of 216 is the same really as a movement from 198 to 199. So um, it's really a nice way to do that. Um, and then just a little bit about the assessment. It's really great independent, common core aligned um, assessments in the areas of reading comprehension and math. Um, we administer it uh, three times a year um, in fall, winter, and spring. Um, and it is done on the computer um, and available inter um, uh, instantly. And so that is really quite exciting. It's different than the Illinois Assessment of Readiness and most other assessments that we take. So, um, and I already talked about those equal interval units. Stop me if you um, have questions um, or if I can help out with any of this. So um, uh, your uh, kids know all about what this adaptive assessment really looks like. So um, really the way this works is that um, a student starts out, um, the first time that they take this, they're gonna start out um, taking a, a, uh, having a question that's about at their grade level. Um, and um, their answer on that question is gonna determine um, the next question that they get. And um, their answer on that question is gonna determine the next question that they get um, until they are getting um, around 50% of the questions incorrect. So this testing software has actually become more sophisticated over time and really sophisticated over the last year, um, uh, really specifically. So for example, um, uh, they have built into the software now um, a, a very quick timeout when students are <coughs> rapid guessing. Um, so that if a student is just sort of buzzing right through, um, we're gonna get alerted and it's gonna um, boot the student off the assessment. Um, so there's not, so there used to be this sort of alert um, in our head, sort of like, is Andy guessing too much? And this is really not a valid assessment. That's not really the case anymore. So um, that is really kind of a nice thing. Um, and they are constantly looking for ways to sort of up the ante there. So um, we use the MAP assessment um, for student benchmarking to make sure that students are on track with our curriculum um, to measure growth um, using a standardized measure. Um, we're required to do universal screening. Um, so uh, lots of people always ask us, do we um, check to make sure that um, our students don't have you know, a math disability or dyslexia or those sorts of things? And this is our way of very, very quickly doing that um, three times a year. Um, so so it's sort of like a um, uh, like taking a student's temperature very very quickly all the time um, to make sure that they're on track with our curriculum, and in each of those areas up there. So. Um, uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, so when you see up here, uh, like geometry, geometry, like kids in kindergarten are even assessed on geometry, but they're not being asked about the Pythagorean theorem. They're being asked about shapes. So um, they are being asked to identify the triangles and the squares and those sorts of things, and that is being called geometry. And then in the upper grades, they are actually being able to um, you know, identify and talk about the Pythagorean theorem and about the measures of angles and trying to find all those different things. And it's the same thing in reading. So the passages start out really short or they might have to identify just simple letters, um, but then in the upper grades, they actually have much longer passages and um, it goes on from there. So all of these skills are actually measured in all of the different grade levels and that's really kind of a, a unique uh, piece of the test, yes. Has anyone done any correlation to determine whether the standard-based reporting has impacted the outcomes in the MAP assessment? The standards-based reporting that we have done? Right, so we're supposedly we're enabling or helping kids understand where their issues and problems are and moving them forward. So that should be reflected somehow in the MAP assessment ultimately down the line. Has anyone correlated whether in fact, right. I mean, I'm thinking to myself, well, if we hadn't done standard-based reporting, we'd have you know, the outcomes. Sure. Now we're doing this and we're doing it for a reason, not only for the kids to better understand, but hopefully allow them to progress. progress. Yep. Has anyone correlated that yet? So um, I don't know that we have correlated our data. I think that there have been correlations done with, uh, you know, massive sets of data. Um, certainly, standards-based reporting is a um, is an evidence-based approach that is um, being implemented in large. Um, uh, larger school districts and in school districts across the country. And so um, I think that um, 
I think that we can look at um, other data sets to answer that question for us. Um, so it hasn't been done specifically with our data, but with other data sets. So. We haven't done it long enough yet right. to do so that, but that would definitely be something that the two of you should do a little bit of investigation with your committee on. And with other data sets, have they yep. found the standards-based reporting has uh, improved outcomes? Has improved the student achievement and student growth, certainly. Yes, we can um, take a closer look at that, absolutely. Um, and then uh, the last piece that we use our map data for here, um, and probably the biggest piece that matters a lot to staff specifically, is that it's used in our evaluations. So 30% um, of um, our uh, teacher evaluation scores and then um, around the same in my evaluation um, is based on uh, the growth. Um, that is made in uh, all of our students' um, scores. And so that is required by state law, um, and that is something that we um, negotiated with um, our staff, our teacher evaluation committee. So, um, so just moving forward um, a little bit to the results here. So um, <clears throat> uh, looking at the percentage of all students in the expected growth range in math, um, so remember when we're talking about expected growth range, we're talking about um, growth that is unique to each student. So um, we're talking about, um, for example, in third grade, 68% of the students in third grade um, uh, were in the expected growth range. So that means that um, they, set a growth they set a growth target inside the MAP assessment um, and 68% of the students met that growth target. Um, and the reason that we um, don't have anything to compare it to for uh, K-1-2 is that th this was our first year um, really giving this assessment, so this is the first year of that data. Um, on the areas of positive here, um, more students in our um, focus groups here, um, so special ed, um, students from low income backgrounds, students in the EL populations are um, in the expected growth range, um, and certainly um, we made a big jump in our fifth grade class um, last year um, in, uh, in this percentage of students who were in that expected growth range. In our areas for growth here, I would say that um, as you look at um, the middle school overall, um, and that was um, sparked by a big um, drop at the seventh grade last year, so our current class of eighth graders, um, was lower than expected. Now, um, I had a conversation with somebody today, um, and they were saying, so does this mean that our students are spiraling? And I said, no, it doesn't mean that our students are spiraling. What it means is that, um, I'll take a score for example, it means that uh, if, if the growth target is 205 and a student um, scored a 204, it meant that they didn't meet the growth target. Um, they could have started out at a 200, and so they still grew this year. They just didn't meet the growth target. And so um, we have students all over the board who were meeting or um, exceeding their gro expected growth. Um, uh, it, you know, we just, there were, uh, you know, quite a few who fell short, and so that is, um, it, a little bit of a misnomer to sort of um, sort that through and um, look at it through that lens of the rest of the students here um, are dwindling or spiraling downward. Well, that's that, confusing. It is a little bit confusing until, um, until you really dig deeper. So it's an all or nothing target. It right. is an all or nothing target, right, exactly. And that is, it's like that for, um, it's like that for our evaluations, it's like that mm -hmm. for the state assessments, it's like that for yeah, all yeah. of these sorts of things, so, yeah. So when it says meeting expected growth, does that also capture exceeding expected growth? Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, moving forward um, in the area of reading, 
um, and this is an area um, that um, obviously we need some work. So the positive area is um, more than half of our students are in the average or above average um, range for growth. Um, and it's important to recall here again that this could be um, the difference between one or two points um, as I was talking about before. But we obviously need to continue to work on improving our um, growth in this area um, and focus on, and in order to do that, um, what we know we need to do is to focus on the students in um, the um, in the target groups, um, that those were the groups that fell um, this year. And so uh, we will certainly be doing that and we have already started to target some of our professional development in that area. Um, we also know that this year, this past year was um, the first year of implementa um, implementation at the middle school, really specifically of um, the um, uh, professional development related to um, the Calkins units of study for reading. Um, and um, we are also implementing this year uh, for the first time ever um, the units of study for phonics because um, they were just released for kindergarten and first grade. So we have had several of us uh, riveting conversations, I would say, about the importance of phonics. Um, and uh, um, for those of you who are not familiar with that conversation, um, it was a conversation that occurred many, many, many years ago. Um, as, and I was teaching. Uh, as integral part of um, understanding reading. Um, and that over the course of the time of many of our teachers going through their programs has swung away in the teacher ed programs. Um, and because of that, um, the way that um, teachers have um, begun to teach children how to read um, has moved away from um, teaching phonics explicitly and uh, most of the research has now moved back into the area of the need to teach students about phonics um, and explicitly teach um, sort of exploding the code and um, orthographic knowledge and letter sound recognition um, as the core basis of everything. So um, we, are, we are thankful that um, uh, Lucy Hawkins and her team from uh, Columbia University have um, now begun working with all of us to do that, and so um, we're implementing that right now. Okay. So at K and one, and they will have that um, in second grade. I know it seems so basic, but it is like, it's really a big thing. So, and we've had lots of conversations about it. So that's reading. Now, on the, on the positive, um, on the positive thing here. So um, achievement is such a different story because when you see these numbers here, it is, it's like, um, you know, it, is it's really amazing so achievement um, again we're talking about the percentage of students who are achieving at or above the 40th percentile um, and so um, a, a significant number of our students are scoring well above the average um, and in four out of the six uh, cases so um, you know uh, three uh, third through eighth grade um, we grew the percentage of students um, who were achieving um, at or above the 40th percentile. So that's really exciting. Um, the areas for growth, um, obviously um, fourth grade uh, dipped slightly um, this last year. And so that is something that we need to work on. But again, um, if, uh, and I, we have talked about this with our colleagues in the area. If you were to talk with a colleague in the area and say that you know 92 percent of your eighth grade class is achieving at or above the 40th percentile, they are going to look at you like you have five heads. Like, how is that possible that you know 92 percent of your students are achieving at or above the 40th percentile? You know that that's really an astounding number. That's really a, a good group of students. Um, so, because uh, that is really a high score, that it's hard to do. Um, and then uh, the same thing, uh, yes? Sorry, why don't we have numbers for the breakout groups, special ed, low income? Um, so, uh, it is just a matter of the way that um, MAP and ECRA break that out for us. It is, it's not, it has not been possible to do. So, Achievement, right. yeah, so. Um, is that something we can overcome at some point or 
Um, so you'll see at the 50th percentile, you'll see that at the end. You'll see some of those scores at the end here. It's just how yeah. ACRA reports yeah. and they're gonna have to change that because it, they can't yeah. do it for anybody right now. Okay. Exactly. So, um, and then um, in reading, um, similar numbers, you know, strong percentages of students across the board um, uh, achieving at really, really high levels. So um, we've got, again, some room to, to grow here and, um, uh, you know, certainly kindergarten, fourth grade, and sixth grade um, from last year. Um, we've got some room to grow that class and um, improve their achievement, but um, overall, not um, not scores that we when we initially looked at these scores to say, "Wow, um, you know, large numbers of our students are underachieving," um, you know, at, at the uh, you know below the 40th percentile benchmark. There, now what that also means there. As I move into this next piece here, um, as I look at the average um, averages across the board, so um, an average student in, I'll take fifth grade um, as an example, the average student in fifth grade is performing at about at the 64th percentile nationally. So that means that um, if you are really an average student compared to the national percentile and performing at the 50th percentile nationally, you're gonna actually probably look a little bit discrepant in Lake Bluff. Um, and if you are performing um, still within the average range at the 40th percentile, you're gonna look really discrepant mm -hmm. in Lake Bluff. But that doesn't mean that you need special education services, and it doesn't mean that you need a whole lot of intervention or support. It just means that you are lower than the Lake Bluff average. And um, so that is something that we need to remind our parents and families of. It need, it's something that we need to remind our teachers of consistently. Um, and uh, it's something that I, even I need to remind myself of. Um, because each year you can see those numbers, um, those numbers go up. So, you know, third grade, um, year over year, uh, from second grade to third grade, those numbers went up by three percentage points. So, in math. And so that, those are, those are good numbers to look at and um, something that we're really proud of. But when your eighth grade, when your average eighth grader is achieving at almost the 90th percentile, you know, that, that says something about your eighth grade students and about the curriculum and about your programs and about your families and about um, what is going on here in our, in our district. Um, and it's the same thing for reading. Yes, Mark. Does the discrepant, I'm trying to weave two stories together here. So yep. achievement and growth. Mm -hmm. Does the high achievement scores partially explain the, 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 some of the struggle that we see with growth, that if we're already achieving at a high level, it's harder to eke out an extra point or two when you're already there. You know, it's like, it's like you get the most production from the bottom, bottom of your yeah. batting order you know, in baseball. If you can bring those people up, you can move the, the total scores for the school and the district, but if you've already got high right. performers, yeah. it's hard to push them Potentially on this assessment. On this assessment, there is potential for that. Um, some, um, they say that there's not on the MAP assessment, but uh, there's some potential for that. Um, just because, so uh, the example that I will give is that, um, so in the younger grades, we, we will see a large growth. Um, you can actually see it right up here. So you'll, you will see a large jump in scores uh, between kindergarten and first grade. So 166 to 191, that's almost 30, you know, 30 points growth. So um, 25 points growth. So, uh, and then as you get on into the upper grades, that growth band narrows and so it becomes a little bit more challenging. Um, what I will uh, sort of warn you is that that's not always a constant. So next month when I talk about growth, um, it's not the same for the Illinois Assessment of Readiness because they do growth differently. So I'm just, that, that's why I'm just, I'm just, yeah, I'm just, because uh, somebody, one of the teachers asked me the same question about our growth on the Illinois Assessment of Readiness and I said, well, it's not really quite like that. Um, and, uh, but it is sort of like that on this assessment. Okay. Yep. 
So right. it's difficult to um, can't sort of generalize. On yeah, that. it is. Um, and then in reading, um, really still strong uh, scores across the board. A couple of uh, um, points down um, in some uh, classes. So the eighth grade class and the um, sixth grade class, um, along with the third grade class, and so some things to keep our eyes on. And then as we um, look at the percentage of students achieving the 90th percentile or above, so this is um, really exciting, and this is in the area of math. So our students um, really continue to outperform others um, on almost every measure. So um, um, I, will, uh, I, I will just say, so I, I'm, I'll point it right out to you. So about half of our eighth graders last year were performing at the 90th percentile or above. So um, when, and then in the district overall, in the area of math, um, you know, about 27% of our um, students were performing at or above the 90th percentile. So we've got some really strong um, uh, things going on in our math program. When we look at objective measures, and we're going to have, um, I think, in the, a couple weeks or months, um, we'll have uh, some additional data about this, but we had um, uh, Northwestern take a look at all of our uh, PSAT and SAT scores for all of the students who had taken um, all of like our third through eighth grade students who had taken um, the PSAT and SAT um, over the last five years um, since we had been doing that. So uh, it actually come our students blow the rest of the new maths cohort out of the water. Um, so our gifted learners in the district, our gifted and talented students in the district blow the rest of the new maths cohort out of the water, um, without question. Uh, there was no, they showed us the data, uh, it was clear, um, and uh, there was like no questions asked. They said there, it was, really clear and convincing evidence that what we were doing here um, and that was working. Um, and then this is more evidence of that uh, happening right here. So um, is that we continue to grow the percentage of students who are achieving um, the 90th percentile or above. Are our comparable school districts in New Mats as well? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. because um, uh, not only our comparable school districts, but um, high achieving students, it's uh, gifted yeah. students mm -hmm. from across the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So it's like the 90th percentile and above students from across the Midwest. It was like a, a sample size of 350,000 students Good. in that Good sample. Really so um, really exciting. So, um, and then in reading, um, uh, Similar numbers, so really uh, very exciting data. So about 20% of our students achieving at about uh, the 90th percentile or above. And when we are looking at numbers, uh, typically when you consider that uh, gifted is um, usually somewhere in the five to 7% range in a school. Um, that's not at all where we are looking, and um, our highest numbers are actually in um, our K-1 um, and in our 7-8 uh, uh, classes, and so we've got some great things happening there. And then, Mark, I think these were the numbers that you were sort of wondering about is um, some of our subgroup performance. So our students with IEPs, um, the percentage of uh, students who were performing um, the 50th percentile and above um, We've got those numbers right there. So this is math there. Um, so some things uh, that we need to focus on there. That's the difference for low income of um, probably two students and then one student for EL. Um, and then um, same thing for reading. Um, and so uh, a dip certainly for um, our EL students and um, probably a dip of two students for low income and an increase of a couple students for um, students with IEPs. So um, a lot to celebrate here, certainly some things that we are focusing on this year um, and um, lots of things that we have been working with teachers already on as the year has gotten underway. Um, and look forward to sharing next month with, the, next month with you um, about how we have um, uh, started to do on our Illinois Assessment of Readiness 
um, assessment, which is our first external benchmark um, that we use. Do we have plans in the works to help these English learners and low-income kids and students with IEPs to bring these numbers up? Actually, you and Kelly are going to be presenting on that. I think you do that when at the next meeting or the meeting after that. So um, to answer your question, we, ha we already have um, begun working on that. Um, so we have uh, identified really uh, key sources of professional development for all of our uh, teachers and for um, um, like our special education teachers who are working with students from EL backgrounds and for our EL teachers. So yes, we are doing that. And then we'll have um, some more information for you uh, about that next month. Yes, much to celebrate here for sure. The, the, where we fell short on the expected growth though, because that's one where I would, I would think that you would expect to see higher percentages. I noticed they dipped overall, it seemed, from last year. And then I'm just wondering, can you speak to that? What, what do you make of those numbers? So um, you're uh, probably talking a little bit about math. Um, and I would say that, uh, um, so our math scores were, you know, our seventh grade um, dipped, that, that was probably our biggest drop. Um, and I think that uh, there are a number of things that can uh, be, that that can be attributed to. Um, I think that our, um, I, I will say that I think that last year was a really rough year for our students. Um, we had socially some and emotionally, and um, and I think that that impacts our students um, in a variety of ways. And I think that uh, as you look at um, our assessments across the board, in uh, and it impacts uh, students at a lot of different times. And I think that this is one of the areas where it came out. I I would expand on that a little bit, not only with the emotional things going on in both buildings and some high need kid situations. The other thing that I've seen throughout my career is when you're really focusing, and in this case, we've really been focusing on our language arts curriculum and really working with the teacher's college because as you can see, our reading scores need to be going up. So you think of all of our elementary teachers, kindergarten through fifth grade, they teach every single subject, and they're spending all this time on the language arts, and sometimes that can happen where there's, it's like, you saw that with math. Our math scores started going up and our reading started going down a little bit because we were pouring mm. our efforts into that. And, you know, it's hard to balance professional development because we can't have our teachers out of the classrooms as much as we would like for the PD. They need to be with the kids. But when you're really focusing on one thing, sometimes we take advantage of the fact that even though they know math, we still need to keep up the professional development in those areas. So um, I do think that down the road, something for you board members that are gonna be around for a while, elementary districts are really gonna have to look at how are we gonna help support teachers at the elementary level that teach all the subjects? How are we gonna do it? Because they really, struggle and have a hard time with that so there's a variety of reasons for that um, but we can't make any excuses these are things that we have to work on and that need to change and we need to look at individual student needs and um, teachers are looking at data and it will change next year we're having a positive year except for having to close school that one day which that'll be the end of that right Great presentation. Any Kevin. other questions or comments for Dr. Rubenstein? Thank you. Nice presentation. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right, so we're going to move on to our action items. Item 9A is something I think we have beaten to death, our 2019 <laughs> 20 final budget. Jay has given us many, many, many presentations about. Does anybody have any final comments or questions before I ask for a motion? So, May I have a motion to approve the 2019-2020 final budget as presented by the so administration. Moved. Second. Second. Third. Third. John Rosen. 
Yes. Julie Gottschall, yes. Richard Hegg? Yes. Andy Duran? Yes. Ann Hill? Yes. Mark Berry? Yes. The motion is approved. Can I ex interrupt one minute? Of course. I have to remind everybody, do not leave tonight. You Maybe all have you. to sign it so we can submit that. Okay. Uh, the second item in our Don't action items is the 2019 Employment Information System Report. This is something we are required to do every year. It incorporates administrator and teacher salaries and benefits data that the school district is required to report by October 1 of every year. Does anybody have any questions or comments about that? May I have a motion to approve the 2019 Employment Information System Report as presented by the administration? So moved. Second. Roll call vote, please. Julie Gottschall, yes. Richard Hegg? Yes. Andy Duran? Yes. Ann Hill? Yes. Mark Berry? Yes. John Rosen? Yes. Motion is approved. Uh, middle school social studies program adoption. Uh, at the August 27th board meeting, Kelly Bay uh, presented the middle school social studies curriculum. We're being asked to approve uh, that curriculum tonight. Does anybody have any questions or comments on that? May I have a motion to approve the middle school social studies program as presented by administration? So moved. Second. Roll call vote, please. Richard Egg? Yes. Andy Duran? Yes. Ann Hill? Yes. Mark Berry? Yes. John Rosen? Yes. Julie Gottschall? Yes. Motion is approved. Uh, item D, the personnel report. Is this the most current one? Yes. yes. Uh, in this month's uh, personnel report, we have a non-licensed termination for Joan Durig, the administrative assistant in the district office, effective September 12th. We have a non-licensed resignation, Susan Van Boning, uh, a teaching assistant taking, who is taking a long-term substitute position at the middle school to fill in for the library media specialist who's on FMLA. Uh, that's at the element. Uh, she's from the elementary school, effective September 20th. May I have a motion to approve the September 24th, 2019 personnel report? So moved. Second. Second. Roll call vote, please. Uh, Andy Duran? Yes. Ann Hill? Yes. Mark Berry? Yes. John Rosen? Yes. Julie Gottschall? Yes. Richard Hicks? Yes. <laughs> motion is approved. Consent agenda. This month's consent agenda includes excuse me, the open session meeting minutes from August 27th, 2019, regular board meeting, the September 10th, 2019, committee of the whole meeting, Closed session meeting minutes from the September 10th, 2019 committee of the whole meeting. The treasurer's report, the impress report, the bills report, and the P card report. Would anybody like any of that pulled so it's not a con in the consent agenda and we talk about it separately? Not hearing anything, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as, appro as uh, provided by the administration? So moved. Second. Roll call vote, please. Ann Hill. Yes. Mark Berry. Yes. John Rosen. Yes. Julie Gottschall. Yes. Richard Egg. Yes. Andy Duran. Yes. Motion is approved. That concludes our action items. Uh, item 10 is FOIA requests. We had two pretty standard FOIA requests this month. If anybody's interested, it's in the board packet. Public comments. Would anybody like to address the board? Now's your time. Please step to the podium, state your name and address. Uh, we give everybody five minutes and we will answer questions after. I can do it in two. Um, Amy Donahue, 755 Mammon, Lake Bluff. Um, I just had one other question about Otis. Um, and I really could probably ask you this offline, but let me just knock it out now while I'm thinking about it. So with the standard base grading and with Otis in place at the same time, I found myself in a situation last year where at the end of the year, I was not sure how my child was doing with the combination of those two things. And when I reached out to the individual teachers, the response I got was, I, I asked specifically, should, do you feel like my child should be taking a foreign language again? No one has said any differently. I'm assuming we're moving forward. Every teacher came back and said, no, this child probably shouldn't. Um, this child isn't getting his homework in, he's not getting his work done, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think of myself as pretty diligent about the everything, that, the Otis meetings, the reports, everything that can be read, I'm pretty much doing. Um, it doesn't mean I'm not missing things, for sure. So tell me this, with the, um, what did you call it, the reports in between that would come out? Reports that would come at the end of a unit? No, um, the, um, the yes, the, the, the in between the progress reports. Um, Use the term, I can't remember what it was. Would that fix that? 
Like, would I have more of an idea of that? I don't, I don't know that I'm comfortable with this Q&A of the principal. I'm sorry. Just I'm not comfortable with the way. I don't think this is the intention of the oh, okay. comment. I didn't, I didn't I think mean it's an offline like conversation. I just want to give an example of my concerns with this database in the OTIS. So that it's, I think having an example is probably easier to understand. Noted. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, at uh, any, does the board have any qu comments that they'd like to make as we conclude? So at uh, 8.22, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So, Second. Uh, roll call. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you. All right. Let me, if all of you.